now. I think Shan was recording before. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the St. Louis Linux Users Group meeting for Thursday, May 20th, uh, 2021. Today we will be hearing from Tyler Rudy. Uh, he is the lead code monkey for Siemens Industry Software Accounts Department. He's the guy who uh, looks at you and uh, sets everything up once you get hired there. And he currently spends his time trying to abuse Python and PowerShell to get to be as lazy as possible. Alas, he is too good at it, so people keep coming up with more work. He will be talking to us today about SyncThing, specifically how to set it up to sync uh, photos, but it can do so much more. Tyler, if you would like to take it away. Well, oh, that's disappointing. SyncThing doesn't have an iOS app yet. Uh, it's free. Okay, so this is a problem solving quest that I had to go on because um, my current solution doesn't work anymore. So basically, here's what I've been trying to do. And there it is. Um, I have this desire not to have those very precious memories on things that I take on my phone stay on my phone. Um, they have really bad habits of doing things that make them no longer available. Um, and I've never liked the cloud solutions, mainly because they get hacked way too much. Secondly, usually you have to sign your all your rights away to use them. Um, so the original solution is this program called Plex. Um, and of course, you're not going to render that picture. So let me just kick over to what did it the web page. So I have a web application running on my server behind me that has all these libraries, and I use it for here's my audio books. Um, here's all my explicit music that I broke out because five-year-olds have access to my library. You know, stuff like that. It's very nicely organized. I also went through and created everybody a library for their photos because I can, it will, up till currently, switch over to the camera. Um, here's my personal phone. No, you can't see my pen. And on its client, it has a ability to upload yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll deal with you later. To upload to a library, which, and it just sits there and watches as I take pictures. And it's set up so that I can use the mobile data. And you know, I turned on the automatically uploaded in the background. So it just copies everything up. Um, and so once it gets to my NAS, then I have a uh, R snapshot pull all that off to its um, over to Elicar, which is its front end as a backup. So let's go back to the. Could you describe what the pronoun it is related to? The photos. So, um, the photos? Yeah, the photos that I. So, so Elicar is a front end to, to our snapshot. Our snapshot. Okay, great. Thanks. I have way too many tabs in my admin. Go away. 
All right, so the goal is to get it to this box here, which sits at my brother's house. And I'm not signed in in this browser. Telling me that's your brother's file server room? No, it's a little um, Helios 4 um, box, but that's a Celicar back, uh, uh, background. I know. I'm just pulling your chain. So this is uh, wait, it archive now. It would worry Lee if uh, you know he had to expand the Bat Cave if he's got to compete there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I work on pies nowadays. Cluster clusters of pies. Yeah, but you got to trade all your old ones in for Pi fours. Why the hell would I want to do that? It takes twice the power and gives you a fifty percent performance improvement. The oh, only cool. thing good about a Pi four is that you can get it with four gig of memory. Yeah, because the internet told me they were better. And I believe everything I see on the internet. Yeah. James, you have no idea how many people that's true. Hey, Tyler, can you uh, bump that screen a few points? So here I have tons of snapshots. I need to, I can go in here and dig into my back up and pull a photo from a few days ago. How many pictures you take? Oh, this is like the last 20 years I have on this drive. Oh, okay. So, so this is my backup chain. This is how I version. So the problem is, is, if, is, is I go back to the deck um, again. Plex decides to further. Uh, how should I put it? Plex found another Balrog that they needed to slay and they decided we're turning this feature off. Uh, so um, it's been a royal pain to keep it running on the iOS. So they decided that they were, they're gonna shut this down and move on to other issues that Plex does better. So we needed to replace the solution. So um, what I found was a very good uh, uh, walkthrough from Linux Babe on how to get sync thing running on a Debian server. So what I did is I went out and built a um, Debian 10 uh, Debian 10 uh, virtual machine out on my on my virtual host. Um, just built out a Pi user, just because that makes it easy for me to remember what the user is and installed SSH. That was the only thing I installed in during setup. So step one is we need to get app get or get these packages installed to uh, curl GUNPG2 and app transfer HTTPS installed so we can um, import the sync thing repository. I'll just do this. Mm. I forgot that I didn't. Uh, 
All right, so let's install that. And with that installed, then I believe it's just setting up the repository for synthing and installing it. So that's basically this. So let's see if I can get this to sit over on the side. You guys still read that? I can. Hey, Tyler, are you taking notes so you can do a uh, how-to on uh, OBS next month? I should, shouldn't I? Uh, window capture of a term. That one. No, not that one. Add window capture. Oh, add existing mobile term. I'll shrink the size of the window so that it's halfway. Make it a little bit easier so I don't have to continue flip, flipping back and forth. I'll remove the, no, don't snap that way, you bloody, go away. It's just a tad bit too tall. Okay. Then add window capture. All right, so first step is to grab their release key and shove it in. No, don't care about you. Then we add the repository itself to the sources. Then we do Update to, with app to read the new repository in. And then we install it, which, you know, it's nice because updates is just app to update. Once that's done, I found this one interesting to, you'll have to define who you run as by putting at after the name of the service. Never had it do that before. 
or had a. Why does one say pi dot service and the others just say pi? I don't know. It was a weird thing with the enable command. It had to have the dot service. Huh. And then we check to see if it started. And I bring mobile term up to the front. You'll notice a few things. One, the GUI is accepting and listening now on the local host, which is a problem. Other than that, we're fully started up. So we need to go on to the next step. And that's this is only because I'm running this out as a on a um, on a server with here or in the or a virtual machine in the network that has no GUI. If this was like your local machine, because you could install this on your local machine and have it a as a client, um, you could just open it the UI locally in it makes it a lot more secure. And we're looking for this statement inside of the system. I'll go down to here and we'll control C. 0, .0, 0 0.0.0, which is internet speak to bind on all adapters. And then we'll just restart sync thing. And if we look at the status now, We see that it is now bound to colon colon and it accepting on colon colon eight three two and this IP this system's IP address is one seventy two sixteen forty dot two two zero. And I forgot the port. So it's on port 8384 by default. And colon colon is a shorthand? Or? Um, sh it's shorthand for, um, for any IP address. And so listening on all, all, all network adapters and all. So if it had, you had both IP version six and so then any of those would be allowed. I mean, the biggest thing you have to worry is if you have something that's bridging two networks, you want to make sure that sync thing only talk to one network, then you would want to make sure that, that that specific IP address was in there. Beyond that, it's just bind to my local IP address and start up. So now we have our very first web page. So 172.16.42.2.0. Uh, yeah, whatever. We're just going to tear this down. We do get a warning that there is no password set. It does it twice. So it sees that this is the same thing. Dem demo, upload is upload and download status, the listeners, discovery, how long it's been up and what it is. Then we have remote devices. So now we're gonna switch over to the phone because we always wanna start from the end that has the files. 
and we're going to go through the setup. Granted permission to to the device to storage because it's got to read storage to get to the files. Uh, don't have to do that. I'm going to turn this off because we're demoing stuff. Yes. Can you refresh my broken brain? Where did we just install sync thing? Is it on the phone? I installed it on the phone beforehand because it's just go to the to Google Play Store and install it. We just installed it on my Linux box here in my lab. Okay. So we now have a two copies of sync thing. One's on my Android right here. Okay. And the and the same thing demo here is my server. Okay. So we're going to go in here and we want to that's languages. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show an ID. This is the core ID. You really don't want to give it away, but since I'm gonna just delete this thing once we're done, you guys can see it. So that's what identifies this compute this the copy of sync thing on my Debian server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it to my yeah discard it. We're going to add it to my phone, right? Devices, add device. Tap on the, right, allow it to take pictures. Now I can hold it up to that barcode and it filled it in. I turn on the introducer, I believe. And we hit OK. And if close this, what should happen once the to get to know each other. On the network. Yes, you're on the network. Would they like to be alone to get to know each other? It's going to pop up with this device. It says XT1575. You want to add this device. Add device. Yaddy, yaddy. So I could rename this as demo phone. So it's not just some, and I could then share things to it if I wanted to, but that's the second way. Um, advanced is just things like how you compare and how it sees things. And now we have down here, remote devices. So now we, what we wanna do is we see that We have this built-in folder called camera that I built nicely for us. We're coming here and we're going to share that to the other device. And for changes. And now we have here on the web, demo phone wants to share camera, add new folder and go ahead and say yes. And since this is, I'm gonna go in here and say, till day, so it's at the home, Pi's home. And photo is the folder I created for it. So Tyler, quick question. So sync thing is all user land on, and on both ends. So all your data is stored under that user? Yes. Okay. Basically sync thing is running as that user. And that's what that at at the end of the service name was about. That okay. told it to start up as. Start up as Pi, okay. Yeah, I'm used to home cloud, but I see a lot of stuff I like on here when, you know, because you got device specifics and just statistics and all that you don't have with home cloud. Uh, 
The biggest thing I notice is this down here on the fo folder path. Make sure that it's where you want it to be because it will not let you change it after you set it up and you'll have to blow the relationship up. Right. All right. The other thing I can come in here and say, is under here, we can do some kind of file versioning. I haven't actually looked into these. And then the other thing I always want advanced, um, this right here controls how it is synced. So really all I want is receive only. Files are synced from the cluster, but any changes made locally will not be sent to the other devices. So it's only gonna come from my phone and go to, to the server. And we hit save. And what we have here is my Android device already here. There's always already 1.14 gig of photos. on the device. And if we go over to my command line, you can see I built out the folder structure already and it's already synchronizing photos over. Let's see if I can get it to open with Uh, let me see. There's the photo. So everything synchronized over. And we can just, then it's a file local, local and my existing backups process can operate on it. Now, let's say we want to go the other way. I have um, um, music. So let me upload that a uh, couple of some music to that full to that server. Not this. Well, that's up, bloody. So we have a folder here under my music, with all the, the stuff that I want on this phone. So what I'll do is come into the application and add a new folder. Folder name is music, not for kids. And grab that folder path, save that. Uh, 
and then we'll go on the sharing on here. We're going to send it to the demo file. And under advanced, this will be send and receive. Now, sometimes I'm out on my phone and I like a piece of music and I want to be able to sync it back. And we got a notification here that says that the device wants to share that folder with me. And it's going to be send and receive. Go tap here to the directory. Let's go to the SD card. New folder, test. Select that folder. And now it's syncing. And we can see both the status on both sides. So it rescans it every hour. And right now, that device is pulling download of 1.28 and 309 up. There's 151 items out of sync. Oh, you do have some other things during setup. So um, and here in the settings, You're coming to the GUI, give a username and password. If you have a HTTPS certificate, you can throw it onto there. Uh, the the um, this walkthrough I went through noted where that file goes, but that's if you need it for this uh, for the GUI itself. Um, it does have NAT traversal, so I haven't had to poke a hole on port 22,000 on it, for it, but it's, um, or you may have to, depending on the, your firewall. Um, but yeah, it's a very simple, let's get data off of, which are synchronized between two different places. And from what I understand, the sync thing will, does run on a Mac, but it does not have an iOS app. I don't know why. I'll have to look into it. It's all based on BitTorrent. Um, it's strictly peer to peer and encrypted across the trans the transfer, and you don't actually have to put anything out there on the internet for things to talk to. And it's all open source. And look, they even have the instructions right here on the website. Fairly simple. You guys have any questions? Going back to the beginning or near the beginning. So how did LCAR backup fit in with Plex? LCAR is, has been given um, file level access to everything that's on that server. So it runs our snapshot on a regular basis to, to version off files off of my main server. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So it's my, I'm trying to get to th three, two, one. So I have my main server, which is my RAID array, array protected by Z2, CFS, and all that stuff. Then I'm, at my brother's house, I have a, it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but it has SATA ports on it. It's called a Helios 4. And it's, I think, you know, it's, So it's just it's just an open source NAS that has four SATA ports on it. And I just strap some odd hard drives in there, installed Debian and installed Elicar backup, which brought along or set up our snapshot to version things off. Okay. okay. But the goal here is, is when I go on my to go see my uh, family for my grandmother's wake. I plug my phone in for at night. Mm -hmm. um, everything that my I took on my phone is whisked off to my server here in the house where FBI has a little bit harder tr time bullying me into giving up my files. Instead of, you know, Google. <laughs> Um, on the phone, I did notice a few things. So I've had the Plex photo sync or the sync in general eat my battery. So um, run when power device is powered by AC. You can tell it to say only run on AC power. So when you plug it in, then it goes out and seeks the sink instead of when it's on battery. Um, mobile data. So it'll take it in effect if you're connected to Wi Fi or if you're just on your mobile. Um, what else? Cabra. <sighs> And this is probably the, it won't open because I didn't give it access to GPS, the ability to run when you're at home. Um, behavior. So that's thinking, it's fairly straightforward. The biggest downside is there's no native iPhone sync, which I guess it means I just need to stop taking fo photos with my work phone. But I'm pretty sure somebody will fill, figure this out because it's all open. You can, it's, they've open sourced the whole thing. Who be they? The sync, the uh, who is running this? Callisto. Callisto being a a for-profit company and they're just doing this out of the goodness of their heart or uh, no it's more like uh true nas they have a home version which is sync sync thing that you can use no questions asked it's all open source you can go and find it and then they have the enterprise version that you can use as if you want to be able to call them up and say why is this being stupid No, I didn't switch the terminal. I'm sorry. So, 
So yeah, Callisto is, I'm guessing that what happened is they wrote it initially and they said, well, we could sell this and, you know, uh, like Red Hat and give 24 by seven support if you want it. Oh, it's, Three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars euros a month for premium support. Whoa, that's a hell of a jump from from uh, free software to uh, that kind of a monthly fee. Wow. Um. There's a comment in uh, chat from Wendell. Uh, uh, Wendell said he has experimented with the versioning feature. Uh, perhaps Wendell, do you have a microphone and would you care to, to interject your comments? It shows Wendell is muted right now. Maybe Wendell's distracted at the moment, or maybe he just can't get his microphone to work. <laughs> oh, there you go. Wendell just responded in chat, having mic issues. We're sorry to hear that, Wendell. Well, Wendell's yeah. putting fingers to keys or before he does that, I'm gonna suggest maybe Wendell can type in a couple of comments in the chat window and turn it back over to Tyler. Any other questions, thoughts, comments for the peanut gallery? No, it's short. It's just. I got another question relating back to Plex, and I realized that was just the pretext to do the talk. But uh, you said uh, Plex isn't going to support their camera downloads anymore. Does that mean they they don't intend to support the uh, uh, the aspect of of being a, a media store for your own photos or oh, the, the media store for their own photos is i think will stay but um i think the it's the it's the actual utility in the client that moves the photos off of the phone and back up to the server that they're going to stop supporting since there's no i mean I got photos here and they've, they've, there's nothing that I've seen that says that they're turning off this type of, of library within the software. Um, it's just, and I've seen it in the forums where most people say, yeah, it's always doing this or it never does that and it's always broken and yada. And it's, being a royal pain and from what I can tell they're just tired of dealing with it and they said other people can do this other people do this quite well we're going to go deal with the next H.26 or the next major codec that or um, their um Um, major plugins for um, like I have a DVR. That one's on Plex. Here's my DVR. This is they're trying to focus more on that that kind of stuff. Whereas and or it's just something that's pu pulling resources that they have 
they have to pull. I don't. I guess the or something like that. Real annoying thing was is that's the reason why I bought Flex was the photo. By the way, is that that DVR function in Flex? Is that one of the free offerings? Is that one of the uh, price? That's the pay. That's, the pay. that's part of the pay. So, the, so there's two DVR, or what you would call DVR. So there's this live TV and DVR, which I have set up for myself to use a HD Home Run Prime. So this is literally coming off of the air here at my house. And I can... watch live TV or record. So here's today's Jeopardy. Um, they've also added some other nice things like um, on the DVR schedule. You now I've added the ability to delete or detect, or detect and delete um, commercials. So, you know, no more commercials, which is, you know, always fun. Um, well, it's... I never understood that. I need the commercials. That's, to me, considered the refrigerator break. And then that means for the next commercial, I need the bathroom break. <laughs> Don't you have a pause button on your DVR? Well, this one does. I Gary know, doesn't have a DVR. I've ever owned has one. So you don't really need the commercials anymore, Gary. You're living in the 50s. Yeah, but then I have to worry about when to get up and, and you know, go to the fridge. It's much easier if it tells me. Oh, okay. I've always been oh, able come to on, 6,500. Bathroom ball by myself. <laughs> That's going to change <laughs> as I get older. I'm sorry, what about 6,500, Tyler? Oh, I was going to show you guys another toy that I found. If my M6500 will boot. It's kind of hard to show booting or to. Uh, boot up tools when on uh, video conferences. While while, uh, while you're waiting, then perhaps uh, Wendell's put back in chat that he thinks he's got his microphone issue fixed. So perhaps while we're waiting for the boot, would this be a good time to uh, get Wendell's comments on versioning? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um... On that versioning part, um, it creates like two different folders. I think one is .st folder, another one is .st version folder. I think the .st version folder, if you choose the file versioning of trash, uh, trash can file versioning, anytime you delete a file, it will store in that folder and then you can set how long you want it remain in that folder before it cleans it out. Um, if you do the simple file versioning, it will, you can set it to where, uh, how many, let's say you make changes to a file five times and you set it for five, it's gonna save five different 
versions of that file. So if you make changes to a file that you didn't mean to change, you can go back to the previous version. Right. Um, if you do the staggered file versioning, I think that's you can uh, set like so many days and it delete the files based on their age. And then the external file version, I think you if you delete a file or something, you can have it you know, saved somewhere else. Um, there's also where if you have two devices synced, so like if somebody's in um, at work and you got your server at home, you can make it to where if they delete work folders, uh, work well files at work, that it won't delete them at home. But if you have the file version you set up, it will save a version of that that file. Um, there's also a thing to where <clears throat> if uh, let's say if you save a file at home on uh, let's say device A and but you don't have device B set up well on to sync that file through because you can set up to where as soon as you make changes to a file it'll automatically sync up the other device because what I do on mine is when I sign in maybe about 10 or 15 seconds I have sync thing will start up automatically but if somebody is deleting files on file A, um, I'm sorry, device A, you can save to where it won't sync to the other device unless you go to the other device and, and sync it. So, um, but I also have mine set up on my phone like Tyler does, but I don't have it synced with every device that I have sync thing on. I have it on <clears throat> sync thing on FreeNAS, and the file, I mean, uh, the phone only syncs with the FreeNAS device, not with any other device that's in the house. And then also I set up a um, sync thing. I set up an open VPN on a laptop. So if I'm, you know, we just meet at the library or I'm over somebody's house or, you know, and I say that file, just in case something, they say, happens to the laptop between um, where I'm at and I get home because I had a VPN set up, it will sync um, via the open VPN. Because sometimes if I um, if I have the, um, if I'm connected to my VPN through my phone, then I will um, have it sync uh, with my phone. Like if I'm out somewhere just because I lose my phone. Because uh, one thing I did do is I had to get a new phone. So I got the same phone. And um, once I got this, this, that new phone set up, I set sync thing back up on a new phone. So then when um, I connected it back to, well, I connected to the free NAS box, it synced everything that was on the free NAS box to the new phone like I had the old phone. So. Yeah, and I have three or four other things that I've been wanting to sync to my phone and because the way uh, Plex does things, it's just like, for example, um, back before the pandemic, I synced an entire season of a show over to my phone so that I could watch it on my, in my VR headset on the plane. Mm -hmm. And the, um, Plex VR app did not see the media in the Plex app for whatever awful reason. So I had to go out and pull each file down um, manually using my software. With this, it's just like, yeah, I want to take this one and I want to sync it to the phone. Go. Mm -hmm. And it's all file based. Uh, also, there is a um, I'm kind of, <clears throat> I think I was reading up on it, but I know sometimes if you save like a file on one device and you go to another device and you do some uh you do something to that same file when it goes to sync back up it'll notice there's like a it'll it'll create like a config file uh, so then like if you go to one of the files you change and you'll notice the changes are there on the other device 
it's, it probably created a, 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 a conflict file and then you can go and rename it, whatever you want to do with it. So that's another feature that it sync thing, sync thing does also. That's good to know, Wendell, because that's always the big boogaboo with me is, is yeah, when, you, when you've got differences originating from two different devices and both have originating content, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, who overrides who? That, that always worries me how that gets resolved. Yeah, so like um, I use, um, example, I'm looking at now, um, key pass, and sometimes I save, uh, create a new entry on one device, but I don't have another device up that it can sync to. So then I go to the other device and I say, I create another entry. So it's seeing two files. So what it does is just creates a conflict file, a conflict file and then you can go in and then <clears throat> you can go in um, and sync whatever file that's, I guess the newest you can sync to whatever that file and just and then rename it to the original original file. So if because it was one time I went to uh, sync uh, key pass and I'm like, I thought I changed that. I tried to access the website. So I thought I changed that password. Well, I didn't have any other device up for the device I was on before to sync to. So when I went to another device, it wasn't on that device. I mean, the, the newest the newest changes went on that device. So it just created a conflict file. And so if I ever had to go back to it, um, to that conflict file and do a comparison, then you ain't, you ain't lose like really a lot of changes that you have made. So that makes sense. But if you accidentally delete one of the files, depending on what file version that you have set up, you can uh, go back and delete it and you can designate how much space you want the deleted files or the files you may modify to to take up space because it, it creates a hidden folder. Um, and it creates a hidden folder, I think for like each. So if you have like um, documents and then you have folder A and folder B, and then a file in folder B, I'm sorry, folder B, it will save that, you know, that absolute path to that file. So you can always go back and retrieve it. Which is all aim. You have to, you have to sit there and make sure it's doing exactly what you want. And that's usually mainly the reason why I keep an external backup, just in case, you know, something goes aside. Yeah, I do too. Um, but even like if you um, install a new version uh, oh, what, distro of Linux, if you do sync thing, set up sync thing on that new uh, installation, it will sync all everything back. It will sync everything to that new device. Okay. And then on that, um, on the where was, uh, title is showing, like, you know, as far as the upload and download, you can set, like, you know, basically like the bandwidth. So if you um, downloaded like a big ISO and set it, you know, maximizing. Um, the bandwidth, you can set limits. So you can still do whatever you need to do on the network without it bogging it down. Leave that, so, uh, yeah, device yeah. Leave, uh, limits in kilobytes right. per second or kilobits. Right. Now the, the other thing I wanted to show, and I just found this the other day, was is um I have this device called a um Zalman and basically 
its job is, is to sit there and hold all my ISOs for install installation. <clears throat> and it's like, I think this thing is like five years old. And let's see if I can get closer. So if you can see there, it allows me to choose which ISO to mount. And in when eh, the system, let's pick one. No. Well, that's all. Add window capture. I don't know. Uh, the device actually lies to Windows. Now, yes. Add window capture. This PC. So it adds this um, fake uh, CD ROM, all based on the ISO that I just drop into here. Makes it real nice when installing another version of Linux. The problem is, is it's SATA base, it's slow, and I have to fight with that UI. So the other day, I found this thing called Ventoy out on the internet. And I need to actually click on the. And I loaded all the same ISOs on there. I can boot any of them from that USB now. And it's just basically a process. Like, uh, you just download the installer on Windows or Linux and it generates these two drives. I don't know if my system is actually seeing the other one. No, it's not. So I'll boot up and then I'll pull the, look at the ISOs and pull them out. So you guys ever need to ha hold on to like five different versions of Debian or something like that. Here's a new a new way to manage all those ISOs. So I? manage those ISOs, th this would be like putting five of them on the same stick? You can put five, 10, 15, it even has a uh, folder mode. So you can say, here's all my Windows ISOs, here's all my uh, Linux make ISOs. Here's all my tools, and you just, as you saw, it was just paging up and down through the through the menu, and it just said, "I want to boot that one," and it will drag that ISO into memory and boot up, boot it. Okay. So instead of having like fifteen different USB thumb drives to install Linux, you can have one. And it's fairly simple to set up instead of all the other painful ones that I've been through. So something else that was neat that I came across this this week. Nice. Probably using this to nuke 
Windows behind me and install a new version of uh, Linux Mint. There's a That's question. A, There's a question. question. Chat from, uh, from Stan. Uh, uh, it says, have you found the GPG key for Ventoy so that you can verify downloads? No, but they do, they do hash their downloads. As you can see here, there's the SHA-256 hash. Actually, those go through, pulls up the, um, the GitHub repo. The nice thing about it is you, to install new um, ISOs, you just drop them into the folder, into the, the it, on installation, it takes like maybe 20 or 30 meg and creates the uh, Linux boot partition. And then the rest of it just shows up as a normal disk and you just drop things in there. may have like, you know, 10 copies of Windows 10. Anything else? Uh, let's see, there's a question from, uh... Uh, J.R. Cherney in uh, chat says, uh, what is the hardware device that you have your ISOs on? The one that emulates the CD-ROM, which I can understand sometimes it needs to be that way because um, things reboot and expect the CD to be there, is a Zalman, so I can find what it is. ZMVE300. It's an old guy. But it was really nice because it just emulates the CD-ROM drive. Why well, probably want that? Uh, a chat from Stan. He says, as I understand it, Ventoy can use any USB device <clears throat> thumb drive. Yes. I actually have a thieving can I even thought of trying to take a M.2 or an NVMe drive and put it in one of these carriers that I have and turn it into a super thumb drive. The biggest problem I've had with this Zalman is that it will um, stop working if I put more like 20 ISOs on it. You know us. We just gather Linux ISOs for fun. Mm -hmm. ISOs for fun, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when you have, uh, what's my new server got? 96 terabytes of raw hard disk space. You have a very bad habit of just cloning the whole Debian package index locally for fun. Okay. Uh, 
I, I, I wanted to, to ask this anyway. I, I wanted to just clarify in my mind the, the before and after of, of what's happened with the presentation night and your storage situation. So, so before you were using Plex's camera backup yeah. function. And the result of that was it was taking the stuff off of your camera and it was loading it on your server at home. But mm -hmm. then your server at home just happened to also be doing a, 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 a backup all the time to Elkar backup. Yes. So basically in the pursuit of, let's see if I can get this image to show up. I had all nice pictures in the slide deck and then it, this stupid program didn't include them. Um, let's take that off. Add that to, no, I don't want that one. I want, code. So I tried writing this all in Markdown. But basically, um, the Plex server sits on top of a my Freemias box, and it just sits there and hosts out the media. And I was using its inbuilt inbuilt ability to save photos to the to its libraries. So the client that I would sit there and watch TV shows or listen to music also would be sitting in the background and looking at my camera roll and pulling things off of it and saving it to um, to the, the FreeNAS, which has got ZFS checking the files and all that stuff. Um, Plex will stay there and it'll stay in bo on both places, but the feature is going away. So basically it will use sync thing to pull data off of my phone save it in the same place and then which will be available to plex to be viewed on things like the tvs in the house and stuff like that and then my helios 4 will be look, still looking at that same set of files and running rsync against it so now i have technically three copies of that photo one on my phone one in, on the, in the data set on the server and the third on my Helios 4 that's at my brother's house that's controlled by Elicar. That whole three, two, one thing about backups. And yes, RAID is not a backup. Um, so for you, the Elicar thing is you're using Elicar software, but you're not backing up to Elica, Elicar nope. corporate site. You're backing up with Elicar software to your brother. So I bring up the, the web page. So Elicar is running locally here on a, and because what, I have a chunk of fiber between the houses and uh, managed switches. Mm -hmm. I took a port and put it on my network and he has his network. And that way it doesn't go through the router. That's why it's on the same IP, same network as my local machines. Uh. But yeah, it just sits here and it will... Elicar basically is just a front end for... Um,
for our snapshot and just runs bin slash our snapshot uh, and syncs everything from those disks down locally to the to the Helios 4, which is literally just a Raspberry Pi-like device. Bring it up. It has um, a whole bunch of hard drives attached to it. And uh, if I just go out there and slash what did I stick it under? T slash No, I probably slash less. Did I build it? Yeah. Hmm. It just puts the files out there in as it gets pulled from the system. And it just runs as a SSH connection. So yeah, when you know, the internet of a little idiot gets into my network and starts encrypting things, they're gonna have to get through SSH keys to get to the backup data. I'm evil. I make try to make hackers' lives as hard as possible. You're no fun. Forty-two. Uh, no. Forty dot sixteen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all I had to do is. I don't know how you guys manage uh, Linux groups. I just had to come into FreeNAS, create a backup user for where it was already built. Elicar built lets you download, generates its only its its. Preferences, no. Manage parameters. Yep. You pull down this public key, shove it into the user, which in premium goes here. Um, then I have groups. Tyler, are we supposed to be seeing something that you're moving around? Oh, I'm sorry. I keep on forgetting that the. Uh, so Alicar has a public key that you download. At least you're supposed to be able to download it. I hate to say it, but what is Alicar? Alicar is a front end for our snapshot. And why do you need it? Because I like, like looking at a web page instead of running editing config files. Oh, so basically it's a web interface to your backups. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. All it does is all it does is configure and pester run our snapshot. Our snapshot does ninety nine percent of the work, and that reaches over via um, a backup user that I built in using an SSH key. So I have an SSH key here that's generated for Elicar. And then this backup user has access via the groups that I built for all my shares. So and it also does all the um, So I do say that sometimes it is a royal pain in the rear end to get to, to fly nice. I've had to rebuild Elicar three or four times because something within the code base went nuts. And I regularly have to go in and say, yeah, you need to reboot. But that's how I back up. It costs me just the power from the wall and the, the lots of hard drives that I've already bought. I put everybody to sleep. No, I'm just trying to figure out what you're looking at there. Is that FreeNAS? This is FreeNAS managing the local groups. So each share that I built. Um, as in share user, you mean, or share on the- As in file share. On, on the FreeNAS. On the FreeNAS, the backup was added to the as a member and then if I that's attached to the pool so here's the one that manages all my photos so sh photo owns the group permission which has the ability to modify and then that's shared via Windows SMB shares, which no. Okay. Thanks. I need to do a write up on this because it's real. The um, groups aren't shared between the 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 um, host FreeNAS or TrueNAS as it's called now, Fox and its jails. So there is a how should I put it? Fun little step of going through and. This one, Tyler, that one up there is fake. All right, here's my depot where I throw all the software that I've downloaded over the years into. Yeah, it's controlled via Did you ever think about doing a quick little block diagram? If On the, the storage itself? Yeah, you know, just who, who talks to what? Because every time I try to explain what, what we've got running around here, I get glassy eyes. The picture would be a lot better to have. Let's see here. Uh, 
What's the app you're running there, Tyler? Okay. That's nice. Go away. So with free NAS, everything gets tied to a pool. It's supposed to be a pool. That's part of a This is So a data set will get be multiple disks tied together in ZFS. And some kind of fault, well, doesn't have to be. And pools are basically just under that as a uh, folder. So, I'll build a group that's sh underscore pool and the in basically free BSD. It's all like every other Linux system. So normally you would access the pool through the group. But a lot of times services will also need a access that stuff. I don't know, what does a share look like? So most of the stuff I run on the background basically acts like NFS. So that same group has to be built on those other systems, be it a local jail or it be a virtual machine that I've built. I'm not really good at this.
No. So the same, I have to build the same, go in and to the OS build GID such and such and build that group out. Just like if it was a NFS share. And then what happens is um, over in my brother's house, I have that Helios device that runs Elicar. And it is accessing it via S, uh, our snapshot, which is over SSH. which runs to the same group because with SSH, you become a local user. And that is kept off site oh, next door. So that's where I store most of my data. It's on those ZFS pools. Right now it's something like 40 odd terabytes of disk. That's nice, you let him pay the electric bill. Well, we're planning on that in, um, once we start Shia mining. I found some old hot uh, server or uh, enterprise grade cache drives. All right. But that's my, my insanity that I have here. Fascinating. Steve, did I hear you start to ask Tyler what software that was? Steve? All right. Hello. Yeah, which, what are you using to draw that picture there? It's a website called draw.io. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hey, James, I was thinking of asking Tyler to comment on uh, uh, Google Photos archive storage whatever the proper term of it is of uh, uh or would you prefer to to make that question something outside the immediate q a of the talk here 
Um, I think the immediate Q&A would be fine with it. Okay. Uh, in that case, Tyler, you'd said that you don't trust that terrible cloud storage stuff. I don't understand that too. Uh, how should I put this? I believe somebody once said that if Harry Potter was written in Google Docs today, Google would have the full rights to publish it in any country that they wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you got That's correct. I wouldn't, Absolutely. So. I just, I don't know. I, I don't trust those people, you know? Let alone the fact that, you know, those idiots, how should I put it? Here's my general photo. Um, those idiots have a very bad habit of um, banning first and asking questions later. Um, banning first? Banning first. Well, you got to go out there and, uh, you know, commit a few rapes, burn a few buildings, and then you got your street cred and they'll leave you alone. You know, the sad part is it's not so funny. Uh, I'm. Am I the best photo photograph photogra photographer out there? No. But uh, you know, I have my moments. Sure. Where is it? This is a cultural. Um, world culture credit that class that I had to take because world culture is what did not fulfill the, the requirement. UMSL's wonderful like that. So I went to Japan and took my camera with me. Where did that photo go? It's kind of expensive to fulfill a class requirement, isn't it? Well, when you've been stuck in the Umsel campus campus for four years trying to get through math class after math class, you're more than willing to spend like four thousand dollars to go see Japan. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Were you carrying SLR or was that a camera? This is an SLR. Those uh, the monkeys that uh, go into the hot springs. Yep, here's the hot spring. Out there. Uh, yeah, here's that hot spring. And if I remember right, to the left, and you can literally walk right up to them. They give no. cares about the humans around them. Hey, your furniture. That is annoying. What are you looking for? There was a specific photo that I actually, you know, took time and the monkeys behaved oh, for. Okay. It was on the way out. This is the human hot springs out there. So were you required to wear the UMSL t-shirt to get credit? On this day, yeah, because they wanted the, the photo. <laughs> Though, it, I, if you look at the group photo, I'm, I've got the wrong one. They all have these. Um, white ones and I had to go get a bigger shirt that said Umsol that was red because they didn't print one in 3XL. 
I hear you. Uh, that is annoying. Did your super backup system lose it? You wouldn't think it would lose just one. Yeah. You would think it would it's lose probably got misfiled back. under the 25th, probably. But anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd like to expand out this comment on uh, or series of comments on uh, uh, Google's photo storage uh, because there's and perhaps somebody can remind me what the correct date is. Is it July the 1st? Uh, up until then, up until now, uh, Google has let you store any amount of photos out into their storage uh, for free. But apparently on July the 1st, that policy is changing and they will start charging for what you store over and above a certain amount. I forget what that amount is. Um, and if I further understand correctly, you are grandfathered in so that no matter how much you have stored out there now, you'll never be stored, you'll never be charged for that, but anything above the limit that you put out after say it's July the 1st, if that's the correct date, then you're going to be charged for that additional? Um, well, I, there, there, there's something that, that I've been seeing on Google, on Google Photos. <clears throat> Historically, they will let you save any number of reduced resolution pictures, but you're limited to 50 gig of full, 15 gig of full resolution. How does that affect the change on July 1st? Uh, because I always say full resolution and I just use Google Photos to automatically grab photos off the phone because I got tired of setting up phone cloud. Mm -hmm. So basically once once the photo uploads, I pull it out of uh, uh, pull pull it out of Google Photos and store it where I want it. Okay. After switching phones four times in the last year, I got tired of trying to set up home cloud every time. <laughs> Does anybody know? Is there a rush by people to to get everything they can out there into Google Photo before whatever the cutoff date is this summer, so that? They've got, you know, they've got the current time to, to overload it. Well, even if that's true, Gary, it, that's only for downsized pictures. Downsized pictures, right. You, you've never had unlimited storage on, on, high, on full resolution. Right. At least, at least from what I've seen. Okay. Which for some people, at least they still may have a lot of stuff they wouldn't mind just saving as, as reduced resolution. True, but it's better to go through and pull out the ones you really want at high resolution and just toss the rest away because you're never going to need them again. <laughs> Says the man who, who, who just posted today about how many terabytes of additional disk he put on his... Uh... <laughs> Well, I just, I, I, that's not for photos. Uh, photos are on a different machine. <laughs> the, the, the machine I was talking about last month is our core box that holds all the R snapshot ver, uh, sets for clients, our servers and clients. Mm -hmm. And for that, we get paid DR storage. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is the photo I was looking for. One of these days I'll take a photo that's really nice and I'll get paid for it. And last thing I want is Google having the rights to be able to publish that photo wherever they want. 
Okay, so I, I, I know, uh, and I've suspected that certainly Google is looking at all the photos that we've put out there. Uh, and, and I've never looked at the EU one. So what is the terms of service? Do they really claim that right? Or are we all just suspecting that someday when they figure the timing is right, that they're going to pull that? I don't think they'll do it blatantly. But I've just lost all faith in Google actually, you know, being honest mm -hmm. or forthcoming. But why would it be forthcoming? That's their primary source of revenue or one of major one. Now, if, if you want to see the ultimate evolution of Google, go go uh, grab them with a the movie, The Circle. On uh, well, of course, that's more it's more supposed to be Apple than Google. But is it Apple or Facebook? No, oh, Facebook's doing the same stuff. They're all doing the same there, stuff. There's another movie, very good, called Google and the World Brain, documentary, and uh, I believe they do have the rights. Anything that they that you store with them. But they're also going to be uh, charging you to read what they have recorded, which have been in public libraries, even rare books that are hundreds of years old. And that surprises anybody. Right here. By submitting or posting displaying content, you give Google a perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, royalty-free, non-exclusive license to reproduce, reproduce, adapt, modify, translate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display, and distribute any content which you submit or post or display through the services. Okay, so you just you own nothing. No, to use the software, you have to give up everything. Okay. Well, you retain the copyright, but they also have the rights as well. Yes. So what it's, it's does owning a copyright make if they mm -hmm. have all those rights? You have none. It's like Microsoft made that genius stroke when they developed MS DOS for IBM. And they said, oh, by the way, we would like to retain rights to distribute it ourselves too. And IBM said yes. Um, I feel bad about all the emails I got on Google, but it's too late to do anything about it. Yeah, well, I'm moving my slowly moving my email over to Proton Mail. Proton? Yeah. Yeah, I got I got an account over there. I like it. The biggest problem I have right now is their contacts doesn't sync with the phone contact. Yeah. Give, them time. yeah, give them time and they'll get probably get there. So has anybody else gone to the Google uh, developer conference in the last three days? No. The, the, the little bit that I did get a chance to stick my nose in on, I got to go back and, and uh, understand better what they were driving at, but uh, they, they they were making a big point, uh, and I believe this was yesterday, it was the day before yesterday, that uh, they were changing things because they realized that Apple has been, you know, waving their nose in it, that, you know, yeah, Apple advertises the exact opposite, that, you know, the, your stuff is secure, that, yeah, Apple may be running the cloud, but they keep it encrypted, and they're not they're not going to use it or any of the things that you just pointed out here in the, in Google's list of, oh, but we get to do this. Um, so. uh, the other thing is, is um, Federation. So you guys ever heard of the story of at N? No. No. Uh, at N, Twitter. Uh, Act. 
So this guy has the um, Twitter name at and. And he runs solely Apple products. Um, so some guys, kids, idiots, wanted his at and handle in Twitter. So they went through GoDaddy to take over his MX record to get to his Amazon account to get the last four digits of his uh, credit card number. This is back in 2012. Oh, and uh, what 2014. Um, Apple, they used the last four digits of it's your so credit that card. The card to... from Amazon to yeah. take over his Apple account, which then they used to get to his Twitter account. By the way, when they took over his app, they destroyed everything. Everything on his laptop, everything on his phone, all of it was gone. So I have this, how should I say, header genius. Do not run everything from one, one vendor. My network, yeah, all the switches are Unify. But the firewall is a PFSense firewall. Yeah, I have a Gmail account, but I have a local Windows account on all my boxes. Um, my personal goal is to make the hackers' lives so hard that they give up. Well, that's that's the point of all security. When I was with uh, in the Defense Department, mm -hmm. you know, it was acknowledged that you can't make anything so secret that nobody can ever get to it. All you really try to do is make it take long enough that the information is worthless when they get to it. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, you know, that's all you can hope for. Or you can just, you know, if you want to store a bunch of photographs, you can buy a bunch of discs and store it all on your own personal. Uh, I have. I mean, so if something was to take control of this server computer and start encrypting my server. Yeah. I got a Helios 4 with a Debian on it with all my files on it. Oh, by the way, this computer has no clue on how to talk to SSH other than through Mobile Extra. Sorry, other than what? Uh, other than my terminal program for Windows. So... It's a um, cat and mouse game. So, and the, with sync thing, I was actually thinking my niece is going to college. I was thinking I should um, propose to her that we throw a sync thing on her Apple laptop and sync her documents to my server. Um, that way, if anything happened to that laptop, like they usually do in college. Hmm. then it's sitting here on my server here at the um, house. And actually my next version of my FreeNAS box, which I'm working on building right now, um, I'm planning on actually putting on, snap, turning on the ZFS snapshots there. So... I am evil. Well, at least I tried to be. First thing you got to do, that's a laudable goal, but the first thing you're going to have to do is convince her that the problem is real. <clears throat> you know? Oh, right. Then tell her never take pictures of yourself that you don't want on the internet. You know, I mean, how many people have pulled that stunt and regretted it later? Way too many. You know, I suspect that a lot of kids don't have any idea. 
you know, how that can come back, A, how that can come back to haunt you and how you have absolutely no control of anything on the internet. What else? Uh, strip the EXIF data from all the pictures? Yeah. You know, the, the other thing that was kind of shocking to me, that kind of amused me, but uh, so I uploaded these photos to that t I took in Japan to Google back in 2016 so I could share it with the other members of the group that went out there. Yeah. Google correlated my movements on my phone, which I was at that time tr letting it collect with the timestamps on the, the, the foot on the camera, which were at least eight hours out of sync. Cause there was, it was still set for central time and figured out exactly where those photos were taken. I put a pin on, on the map in Google photos. I'm like, some days I hate you. Yeah. You are scary sometimes, Google. Why do you have your location turned on? I was using it to track where I went on the trip. Oh. I figured that kind of data would, would um, be minimal because I wasn't going to be going back there afterwards. Let alone if I got kidnapped, then they could be used. I, I don't understand what the time difference you you had fo you had location. So, so I set up my 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 camera here in St. Louis. I didn't change the clock on it when I went to Japan. Yeah, there's a good eight, twelve to ten hours difference between that. Yeah, my phone automatically updated itself because it was connected to the to the telephone system over there. Okay. So when I uploaded the DSLR pictures, those timestamps were still in Central Standard Time. Oh, okay. And uh, okay, and the camera doesn't have. And my phone was reporting up to Google where I was in Japan Standard Time. Okay. Google still figured out where the photos were taken. Well, because you're, oh, wait a second. Uh, well, if you got, well, maybe you it got bounces her. back to a server, and reports back. Oh, I figured they just said, "Oh, wait a minute, these are all offset by X number of hours." Yeah. Well, that, that wouldn't give you the north south. Well, you you would then say, "Oh, these are all off by X number of hours." Back play the the uh, the movement data by that amount and he said, oh, here's this here. Yeah, I mean, that's not even hard. You know, if There's that camera that they have out there. It just takes all the famous pictures. I, I, I think rather than worrying about doing the offset of the time though, it was just looking at the location data off your phone. They weren't taken on my phone. They were taken on my DSLR. So how'd, how'd you get them up on Google Pix? I copied them up there when I got home off of the SD card. And your photos had the, uh, so you're saying the photos didn't have GPS data, but your phone did. Yeah. Okay. It collated the GPS data from my phone to the, the the DSLR data or photos from my DSLR, even uh, though the timestamp was somewhere between six to 10 hours off. And, and this was correlated some days after the pictures were taken and you were now back at St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's a little more devious, okay. Do you think your camera has anything like Bluetooth or anything like that? that it has Wi-Fi, but I turned it off to save the battery. Ah. Does it have a GPS chip in it? No. It was an extra add-on that I didn't pay for. And if you look at the EXIF data on these photos. Let's 
see here. Not that display. That display. I mean, it's all there, still there. It's got the focal length, shutter priority. Twelve thirty in the okay. afternoon. I think there's a provision in that metadata for. Uh, there's supposed. There's supposed to be a location. Subject distance, flash energy, focal lens maker, for contrast saturation, digital zoom, initial file. There's supposed to be a property somewhere here in the extended if data that. Of the, for the location. I've seen the spec. By the way, I'll just point out that in the chat, J.R. Charney points out that he's tired of the NSA spying on his all of his social media and never liking any of his posts. Is it that hard for them to friend him on Facebook? See, they're just so inconsiderate. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, proper, the metadata on my photograph that I took when I was in Maryland. The camera that it must have been a phone picture because it's a Motorola. Yes, and a Motorola, but it's got a spot in here for uh, all kinds of GPS data. You know, so if your phone has the capability, of right? The and I'm looking at one that I took with my camera with my phone here. Yeah, you know, we 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 had marveled that uh, uh, Google was paying to have people in automobiles drive around and just constantly take pictures as they drove down the street, so that they could populate Google Maps with. with and that's the other thing that it, it could be is that they're comparing photos too close to what to other ones that they know have known data of. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. I'm pretty sure the guy that came up with this said, oh, this is nice. I can put pins on that maps for everybody, even if they didn't have GPS data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. One of these days, my paranoid site's going to get me. Here's something I'll never be able to do. Evidentially in Tojaji, the, this hole in the post here is the same size as the uh, main Buddha's nostril. Huh. If you can fit through it, it's good luck. I'm like, <laughs> never gonna be able to do that. Nope, <laughs> that's a fact. I'm just puzzled as to why 
either being in or out of Buddha's nostril is good luck. <laughs> being Stop. able to pass through. <laughs> I don't know, I know either. It's just, you know. If you were, you know, yeah. in Japan, it would be obvious why that was important. You know, Jesus talked about uh, sending a camel through an eye of a needle. Buddha was more, more about the nostrils. <laughs> yeah. All I have to say about that is, uh, 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 shoot! <laughs> that was the, this one was the interesting. A lot of shrines and temples over there. This one's like all blinged out. Ooh. Thought you were going to tell me that was the outhouse at the county park in Tokyo. No, this is Nico. It's um, due north of Tokyo. It's a Shinto shrine. That was an interesting Thank lesson you. of having to go through to learn how to plunge yourself properly. <laughs> then there was these two jokers. You have to be careful in Japan. Sometimes the trains you get on split. These two are on the wrong side of it. They had to get off and come back, back and get on the right train to, to get to where we were going. None of us actually knew it, but you know, scared the living daylights out of the teacher. So the, the trains are like the cars. They ride on. They drive on the other side of the road. So they what? They drive like in just like in Britain, they drive on the other side of the road. And right. I think it's the trains to do, do train. too. Is that Kabuki Theater? Uh, Tojaji. Um, it's a. Let's see if I can find their logo. Basically, it's like Warner Brothers over there. Um, when they're. So it's like a medieval Japan theme yeah. park. So yeah, basically it's their back lot. So it's like going to um, Universal Studios. Except for it's more like it's a working set. So there's um, there's some shows, there's some other things, but I mean, this is a period specific red light district that they built for some movie. Um, here's a period specific half of a bridge. And there were guys there from foreigners that were taking um, pre-production shoots. Um, it wasn't even just feudal Japan. Now it's um, yes, that's their version of the Wild West. Yeah, well, a lot of our spaghetti westerns uh, influenced these guys, the companies like this, and they made things like Seven Samurai. You 
you can either, if you felt so inclined, see if I can find it. Um, I think this was a married couple dressed up and doing things here. I think this was her dad. They were getting pictures taken. Or a newlywed couple. Then, you know. Instructions, huh? A lot of, you know, little kids take, uh, having photo opportunities. And they were going off all, on all these bouts. And then, you know, they stop right in the middle for a photo for the parents. Ah. <sighs> on the blade so the kid can't move it. Yeah, they were all dull blades. They wouldn't give a kid something that could. Toei, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was an interesting trip. Basically, spent two and a half weeks in Japan for um, for basically four credits, and all I had to do is uh, write slash do one or two projects or papers at the end of it after we got back. I am. I just collect all my photos up here. Give Tyler a camera and he'll take pictures or something. Four years. And for the most part, they just sit here until I know. Have crazy people show up and they start showing off photos like you know the old slideshows. Mm -hmm. All this was an art piece, and on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Where's that taken? What was the name of that building? Tyler, I don't know if you can hear Steve. He's asking you, what is the name of that building? I'm trying to remember. I figured it would be easier just to go look at the Google Maps and pull it out. Uh, Grand Canyon Village is here. Desert View. Go down. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's this. Yeah, it's this watchtower right here. Basically, it was a Native American uh, cultural center on the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon uh, rim. And it's out over here on the closer to the eastern edge of the park. So you normally come up here to the Grand Canyon right. village. If you follow it, like you're leaving through the east end of the park that was out there. Basically, they needed to rehab the 
or tear down the tower and they said you guys want to put up cultural uh, art or and they said yes and oh, did they tear down the old uh, no they the, when they rehabbed it they I think it was an old watchtower for the army or something like that I don't know. It's been there a long time. I I was there 50 years ago. That tower was there, but I don't yeah. remember anything about it. No. Oh, okay. okay. It's a uh, no. It's actually a full art piece. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, sorry guys, I gotta go. Um well, let me before uh before people start dropping off, I would like to make one uh, somewhat of an announcement. We, we the, the entire group, uh, the SLU general meeting, this meeting, uh, probably Slack and uh, uh, the new users log as well. We, we've talked about what we're going to do now that hopefully the COVID pandemic is is uh, starting to come to an end, or at least at least a, a, a safe point. Uh, so a number of people would like to get back to having uh, in-person face-to-face meetings. Uh, at the same time, there are some people who really like the uh, 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 format of being able to do this all online virtually. Um, so we kind of like to see if we can do the best of both worlds and both have in in-person meetings, but at the same time put them uh, put them live out on the internet. Uh, so uh, th there's been some suggestions of uh, perhaps uh, certain hardware and software we might utilize to do that so that we can put things up on the screen in the room and yet at the same time have what's going on in the room pushed out over the net. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, it, it's stuff that's been done before. Obviously, you know, other people in the world have wanted to do this and have been pursuing it. Um, but uh, uh, it's something that somebody has to master the art and figure out how we're going to implement it ourselves. So what I'm looking for is uh, both uh, volunteer and also just ideas. So if anybody has ideas of how to do it, we've had a few suggestions, uh, but by all means, uh, maybe post them out on Discuss and, and uh, uh, that'll give us some ideas what other people have addressed. And then volunteers, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, we're, we're running a little low on volunteer help. So if anybody would like to, to head up or even just uh, be a contributor to this project and help run the, uh, uh, this uh, dual, dual mode type meeting, uh, uh, speak up and let us know that you're interested and we'll see if we can put together uh, a team to kind of see if we can do this two-way meeting. Uh, don't have an exact date, uh, obviously, you know, restaurants and stuff are just kind of now starting to open up. So uh, maybe mid or late summer, we might be able to uh, to move forward on this. So, uh, so yeah, somebody volunteer, please. I'll tr take a look into capturing, uh, since I've been playing around with OBS, the biggest trick will be getting the uh, laptop output, capturing that and putting it out. Well, I, so I've got the solution to that. I got a splitter. I haven't played with it yet, though. No. I'll tinker with it. What have you got, Lee? Uh, I, one of the things I got six months ago was a splitter. It takes the HDMI output from the speaker's laptop and splits it. One version goes to a projector, and the other version goes to a second laptop that's running OBS. Oh, OK. I mean, just take the camera and 
its audio and pipe it into OBS. Right, and then that, that would be for... And from OBS, we, we either throw it at... Um, throw it at the like YouTube or I haven't heard of a plugin to, to stream to a uh, Zoom meeting yet. Well, I figured the, the laptop on the other, running OBS could be running Zoom. On the other yeah. hand, I did, did just see a button. I haven't tried it. Let me try it here. Uh, tools. Can you share your screen? Let me, because yeah. right what I have here is the preview. Right. And that's what you guys have been seeing is the preview. But there's also, I saw something in here about start virtual camera. And let's go into, uh, Stop sharing and start video OBS virtual camera. All right. What are you guys seeing right now? Because I'm not your your desktop. Okay. Let's see here. Actually, I'm not seeing anything. All I see is- I just stopped the sharing. Uh, start video. There we go. Pin. How's that? Nothing. Nothing's being shared. Well, I- Or if you look at my video. I'm looking at- you know, you're in the gallery view here in the grid, and what's in the grid is whatever your camera's looking at. It looks like it's looking at your screen that you just had on your sharing. Yeah, okay. I think it is looking at the virtual screen, but it's not coming across. It's coming as the virtual camera. I have, OBS now has a, a virtual camera. So what Zoom thinks is my webcam yes. is actually the output from OBS. Right, but see, you don't want that because you want the webcam to be pointed at the crowd. Right, but what you do is you go in here and say, like this scene here, where I have a mix. Right. So this is a, this is an application on the left. Wait, well, that's weird. But I'm saying that can't be a camera because you can't force that to full screen. You, you need to be able, we need to be able to capture it as a screen, which is why I thought uh, we would use a external HDMI on the OBS laptop, use that as a source for whatever broadcast tool you're using, whether it's Zoom, Jitsi, YouTube, or whatever. Anyway, let, let's table it for tonight and uh, Maybe we can set a time when we can get together and play with it. All right. Yeah. I, I had the hardware planned out six months ago, but I haven't had time to fool with OBS yet. In fact, I don't even see it. Uh, did you find it in packages in your distro? I haven't gotten to doing it in Linux yet. I'm running this all on Windows right now. Oh. <coughs> uh, Barf. Hey, I'm working on it. I got the hardware behind me. <laughs> It'd be running right now if I didn't need to put together a certain presentation. <laughs> uh, what? What is? Do, do you know what the name of the system is? Because all I all I see in packages is OBS service, and that is not OBS. It's open broadcaster software. Right, but it's called, it's called OBS, right? 
Well, OBS is the acronym. But there's no broadcast. Well, apparently you can live stream with it. No, no, I'm saying, where do you get it from? Oh. Um, OBS-Studio. Yeah, the, the URL is obsproject.com. That is weird. Why? No, I'm just looking at the output of my camera. Yeah. It's flipped around of course, on my screen. What about your guys' screen? No, it looks normal. It's too small. I can't read it. Yeah. Oh, you're thinking that you're looking at yourself in the mirror. Oh, that could be it. It's it's thinking. Uh, uh, it's a it's got a mirror so that I'm. Yeah, it's not the camera. It's the way that you've got Zoom set to to do to do a mirrored display instead of an actual display. Uh. Mm -hmm. What version do you have? Uh, wrong one. Did I find I'm finding twenty six point one studio. On my Windows machine, I have version. 26.1.1. Okay, I got 26.12 here. Okay, well, at least you have something to play with. According to this, I have OB and the Debian package manager. It's got 22.0.3. Oh. The biggest problem I think I will have to figure out is the capture process and because the current capture card I have does not like Linux. What are you capturing? Right now it's plugged into my VHS player. Oh, yeah, well, you'd have to use a USB device or something like that. Well, it's a US, it is a USB device. And it's probably Windows only, so. It's one of the those cheap $25 HDMI capture dongles. Yeah. I was able to get OBS to, to see it on Windows, but it's fighting it on Linux. All right. I'm hungry. I probably should go get eat something. I wouldn't want you to waste away. I need to get something. on with OBS next next week. How about that? Or next month? Sounds good. Yeah. Lee, I have a couple questions about Redmine. Sure. Um. I've tried to stand it up in native Red Hat first and Ruby was fighting me. So I went out and looked for a VM and I landed on turnkey Redmine, which was pretty easy. Um, it's, you, go to, you go to redmine.org and then you go to their um, appliances page and then it says click here for turnkey and you go and you get it and you install it and it comes up and poof, you've got Redmine right there. But okay. When I try to when I try to migrate my database, <laughs> ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Why not? Because you're ten years old. How did you get yours done? That's the secret sauce, my friend. I didn't even do it. Who did? I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you were we were both at zero point eight something, weren't we? 
I was 0 0.73. We were 0 0.73. Yeah, and now it wants to take you up to, was it 2.4 or 4.2? No, 4, yeah, 4.2. Um, did, did you try? Oh, yeah, we, I, we did it. I haven't done it for production yet, but we did it for a test. Yeah, I mean, I've, it, it, it's kind of, it, it sounds simple, but it's not. You export the, the MySQL to some, to a my, to a dot sql file and then you then you load it into the, the new version of mysql and then the fun begins then then you run rake which i know nothing about it it won't work rake doesn't work it, yeah, it won't, rake, it won't rake, handle that large a jump because you have to actually change the structure in the in the table in a way that is not what rake supports that's what I was wondering. I mean, I, I typed rake and it said, okay, I'm going to convert this and convert that and whatever. I was like, where are you getting this from? Well, it's got some kind of um, DB, DB migrate slash DB, you know. Right. And, 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 and it, it, it will go like two or three versions, but it won't go 20 is the problem. If, I mean, I, I evidently not. I mean, I didn't quite understand how they put it up because it's like, well, first I'm going to alter this table. Then I'm going to alter that table. Then I'm going to alter this table. And I had all these steps, but I thought this, and then, and they, the first, the steps are numbered like one through eight. And then after that, they have date timestamps. And they, it's like, they just keep, it's, it's like they walked you forward from the dawn of time, but it got down in there and it said, well, the first thing I want to do is try and create a table that already exists. So that's a problem. So I just deleted it and let it create it and move forward two more steps. And then it said, and now I want to inherit. And it says, I can't find the method called inherit. It's like, what is a rake method? That's part of the rake program. And you, the problem is you have to use the older version of rake. I think we had to use two different old versions of rake to get the steps in the middle. Yeah. So did you do it on, did you, did, did you go out and get Redmine and install it on SUSE rather than running a VM? No, use a container. A lot more flexible. And I mean, so you got a, you got a, uh, you got Redmine in a container from somewhere. Yeah. And then you, and you were able to get an old version, an intermediate version. No. Uh, we, we, we built the old, we manually built an old container to handle the structure changes. And then after that, the migration worked. Okay. Where, what, what is a good version of Redmine that bridges the gap between old and new? I, I didn't do it. Um, okay. Yeah. Two, two point X or three point X. I the type. other one I had a problem with was the subversion half of the tool. Um, it, that stood up really cleanly. But again, this appliance, it, it's like, okay, here's your, here's, here's all your, here's my little stupid hello world subversion. And then I imported my whole subversion database and it said, yep, I can browse the, the repository. But as soon as you try to open a project, it says, I don't know how to authenticate. It's looking for uh, user bin PW auth, user S bin PW auth, and that executable don't exist. PW auth. Yeah, authorization. In other words, when you, it's, it, it starts to, when, when you, when you try to, open, you're in your projects, you know, you're, you, the subversion hits the top level of your repository and says, here's all the projects in your repository. And then you click on one of those and it's like, just a minute, let me authenticate you. So it brings up a login screen. And then when you log in, it says login denied. And then you go look at the log file and it says password doesn't match. If you look a couple lines higher, it says user S bin PW auth command not found. Well, of course, the passwords didn't match. Did you when say you got a command uh, not found? Uh, Papa whiskey or Charlie whiskey? Papa whiskey. Papa whiskey. Hey, you, yeah, password authentication. PW auth. Yep, it's not there in the container. Yeah, um, and and uh, I was only. I mean, it was kind of a frustration to me being you know Red Hat centric. 
but you understand why that the that the appliance loaded Debian. It's like okay, but Linux is Linux. It's not BSD. It's Linux. It's just the well, uh, no, it's it's two it's two major flavors. Uh, Red Hat is RPM. Debian is App. Is right, there are two major flavors, and there's the slightest bit of difference in the RC start scripts, but but not so much that you can't work around it. It's more about yeah, doing a doing a yum install or an apt get or or whatever. So the oh. command, I mean, the command line was all the the. The command line is all. Oh, then I would got so I got so aggravated. I about hit the ceiling. I'm trying to write a uh, MySQL export script, and this guy gives you a real nice one. He says, "Here, cut and paste this into your editor and run it." It's like pound bang slash bin slash sh. Okay, cool. Let's put that in there. So I start running it, and it's like because bin sh is a symbolic link to um, zsh, I think. Or dash. It's a it's a symbolic link to dash instead of the bash. And the dash is stupid. It doesn't understand the same commands. The same primitive low level built in Unix commands are not there in the dash that are there in the bash. Change the shebang in the. Uh, uh, that's, and that's what I did. I mean, that's all. That's what I did. Instead of saying bang bin sh, I just said bang bin bash. But it was the. Um, when you read and you prompt and you get an answer, you know what I'm saying? That the, the dash does not allow a timeout. The dash T argument is not authorized in the built-in primitive read in the dash, but it is authorized in the bash. Whose dumb idea was, was that to make bin SH be a symbolic link to dash? Oh, it's. I, think I mean, if you want like to make root home shell, if you, yeah, if you want to make roots home shell be dash or this, that, or the other thing, but but bin sh is supposed to be a born shell version of sh, not csh or ksh. No, uh, it's supposed to be. It's your default, which can be POSIX compliant, but some people turn it into fish for some reason. Yeah, it's just that you shouldn't, I mean, if, like I said, if you want to change your, if you want to make roots uh, default shell be bin something else, that's a, that's a different story than changing the behavior of bin sh. So that was a, it was just, it was aggravating and it was a minor wrinkle. Like I said, you just put a different uh, pound bang at the top of your script and it fixes it and everything's fine, but uh, so that that'll, but I'm still have. So yeah, I can't. I'm 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 dead on both halves. My my subversion is working for the hello world, but not working. If I turn off 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 authentication and let um, guest give guest you know full access to the repository, then all of my subversion source code is there and is available. I'm I'm just having trouble with the authentication part of subversion, but I'm having trouble with the the importing and you like just like you said lee we're just too far behind you need to find an intermediate well then not only that you got too many uh potholes i mean all all we did was convert the database drop it in a container and start it it's a database conversion is tricky and i, I never never touched subversion never touched any of that crap uh, although I got to read over, I haven't looked at it for a month. I really got to read over the notes again. Well, I mean, you're probably using Git rather than Subversion as your um, source why code would you control. Use, why would you even trust Subversion? It's just it's just the way it was. I mean, whoever stood it up, maybe when Carl brought it into the shop, or maybe it was even before Carl. I don't know if names. I don't know if you recognize names like Ken Bergeron and, and Steve Farnsworth. Those uh, those were uh, EWR guys. Program. Yeah, and I, so I don't know who built the first um, Redmine database, but when they did, Subversion was the source code control tool. Therefore, all of our source code is in Subversion. <laughs> source code for what? Uh, the in-house developed code that we've been developing. 
You for, you mean for RCP? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that has nothing to do with red mine, though. Say that last sentence again. I said, what does that have to do with red mine? I mean, it it doesn't. It, in one sense, it doesn't. But this, but the appliance the, um, installs both red mine and subversion. They're they're kind of. In fact, when you when you stand up turnkey dash red mine, you you get both a hello world subversion repository and a hello world git repository. They're they're married to red mine. I mean, red red mine wiki pages can go straight to a repository. They're they're, they're loosely coupled. That's I, that's that's your configuration. Wiki, yeah, pages they're, they're, in, wiki pages are in my SQL. You can link right. a repository to Redmine, but that has nothing to do with Redmine. I, I hear right. what you're saying. They're it's it's they're loosely coupled. You know, there's a there's a couple of Redmine Ruby links that that are hooks or whatever into whatever source code control tool you want, even RCS. <laughs> right, and and that's what happens when you define a repository. What I'm saying so is that that's... they're, yeah, they're both hosted on the same box. And as I'm trying to bring that whole box into the future, that there's really only two apps on the box, Redmine and Subversion, and they're loosely coupled. Right. But what I'm saying is Subversion has nothing to do with Redmine. If you get the Redmine up, then you can define a repo and deal with it later. You don't need oh, you're right. You can bring up one or the other, right? I mean, I brought up the I brought up the subversion work first. It sort of worked. I brought up the red mine. Yeah, there, there. You can bring up one or the other, and the only difference was that the, the I decided to abandon the white. I was I got stuck on one and switched to the other because I got stuck on subversions authentication. So I said, well, let's go back and try and get red mine working and see how it does authentication, and then maybe all of a sudden the subversion authentication will authentication will just instantly start working because it's using Redmine's authentication instead of its own authentication. Because they're both somewhat browser based. I mean, you know, you, you hit an HTML page and then it goes and, and serves back either the Redmine web page or the subversion repository. They're both H, HTP, HTTPS based or HTTP based. Which brings me to another question, which it, let's play another round of Stump the Chuck because I don't know the answer to this one. Um, the Red Mine installation wanted to wake up and recognize both port 80 and 443. Fine. I, did, I decided that I wanted to stop using 80 because we store some stuff in Red Mine that I don't think should be traveling around out there in the clear. Well, you don't Why export port, no, the only reason to have port 80 there is if you get a connection on port 80, it redirects to 443. Um, maybe the firewall will do that, but no, it, the, the web server does. Nginx or Apache does that automatically when you configure it. That isn't that isn't the way I was in seeing it or interpreting it. I was interpreting it that when you if you hit port 80. Then you're going to continue to visit HTTP web pages, and they're not going to be encrypted. Then and if you hit your server is misconfigured, then you're going to continue Stanford, to visit HTTP your server web is pages. Your server is misconfigured that it would never be set that way in the real world. Well, the this was the way the appliance was configured out of the box. Well, that's what you get for for trying to play with something you don't know, you know that you didn't configure. <laughs> but here's the here's the here's the question. Here's the actual technical question. So I I disabled port 80 from Redmine and made port 80 just go over to an HTML script where I could say, "Hello, this is your, you know, this is your touchdown welcome point. Cl click one of these other links to really enter the application that you're trying to get into." Now, so you've hit, so the, oh, it's just a short little HTML web page that I'm trying to redirect back to the same box. If you put an, an, ad, an, a, an a tag, this is an address tag in an HTML program that says href equals, and if you say HTTP colon slash or 
slash folder name, it just it just says, okay, since it starts with slash, it's slash that folder name on this server. And well, so it fill, it fills in the name of the server. But if you if you say HTTPS colon slash, the browser tries to take you to HTTPS triple slash and can't figure out where it's going. Because you don't have a server name in there. You don't, for an HTTP colon slash path name, you don't need a host name. Correct, because, you, because you're on a local host. But, for, but so why can't I do the same thing for HTTPS colon? HTTPS is going to your Redmine box if it was on that machine, but since it isn't, it, it can't figure out where to go. No, they're both on that machine. That's what I'm saying. They're, everything's right there on that machine. <laughs> except the except the browser you know the browser's coming in remotely but once it lands on this touchdown page which has got two different hyperlinks one that says http colon slash and well, one that I, says https I, I, I colon say slash. It, but, but but you dug yourself a deep hole and i have i don't have a ladder you're, you're better off filling a hole in and setting it up right well, what I'm at, the question I'm trying to ask is if you're on, if you're writing, if you're trying to write relocatable web pages that are not, I, I don't want to leave this host and go someplace else. I just want to point to another page on this host. And so the, the href says https colon slash path name, just, just stay right here on this host and go over to this other page. It don't. I've never, I've never screwed it up that bad. I'm sorry. I have no idea. I mean, I guess, I guess I didn't, I thought I tried, but I didn't, I didn't take good notes. What if you just say H, what if you just say href equals slash path and don't specify a protocol? Right. That will then stay on. That will, will stay it, on the current server. It'll stay on the current protocol that that from the referring page. Yeah, but but the point is, you're still leaving. You're still leaving an insecure connection. You don't want port eighty open at all. The only reason to use port eighty is a three hundred one to your HTTPS. Well, it wasn't 301, it was 443, but whatever. No, no, no. 301 is the HTTP, HTTP, HTML return, HTTP return code for permanent redirect. Oh, okay. I'm that sorry. tells the browser you're coming from, don't use this, use this for everything. And then it, and it automatically jumps to HTTPS instantaneously. Okay, where do you put that return code? in the server configuration. And that depends on the server. You have to create a virtual host. If, well, it's, yeah, an, if, it's, engine, if it's Nginx, it's one thing. If it's Apache, it's another. OK, these, are, these were virtual hosts. It, I was just trying to, because I've had, I've had this same problem inside of Redmine, where you're trying to, inside of Redmine, you're saying, now, now for further information, go see this page, right? And the, the, the laziest thing to do is to give a fully qualified UNC to the page you're trying to visit. For and the first, like, for, no, you, you need a full FQDN for the first link. After that, you can be relative. Yeah, and but it's a little bit tricky. The way that you be relative is something like tilde project name slash page name. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it, 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 it's not... It's it, 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 it's a little. As soon as you learn it, it's like, oh yeah, it's so obvious. But it's not. You know, if you you can either give a full a, a, a fully qualified domain name, which is just a you know protocol colon slash path name, or if you're just trying to stay relative to this internal Redmine thing, it's a slightly different incantation, and it's project name colon wiki page. And I'm trying to do the same thing from HTML, not from the wiki, but from HTML. It's like, okay, I landed on the splashdown page. Now I want to stay right here on this server. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll try that tomorrow. I'll try that and say, well, what happens if you just say, we'll just keep using the 
But see, I touched down on an insecure protocol and I'm trying to get it to switch to the secure protocol. And that's where you're saying I need to set up the 301 code. Right. You, you want to redirect. Because what you're doing is you're launching a new connection without a host. Yeah, I'm launching and it, it, it's just, it was not intuitive. I mean, it's like you can, you can launch a new connection to an HTTP on this host, but you can't launch a new connection to an HTTPS on this host. All right, so you're right, but you're right. In, in, in the sense that Subversion and Redmine are separate, if the, the chore here is not in getting Redmine, well, if you install Redmine from scratch, the chore is getting Ruby, Ruby configured right. If you install it, if you install an appliance, the chore is in getting your database converted. <laughs> no, you got the same, you got the same migration problem, whichever way you go. Yeah, it's just that when you do, yeah, when you do appliances, you're, you're kind of limited on being able to find an intermediate version that's a couple versions old. Yeah. When you, no go, when, when you build it from scratch, you can just dig through Redmine's repositories and say, yeah, give me a version of 3.x. But then you got to have the, you got to build a Ruby environment for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I got to go. We'll catch you later. Yeah, it sounds like I'm going back to the drawing board. Thanks, Lee. All right. Anybody else can stick around or should we close it down? Hey, guys, I have a, this is Jonathan here. I have a question for you all. Uh, my, my good friend Robert Sitek managed to get uh, Docker installed on one of my Linux distros. Um, what's a good book on Docker? I haven't touched a book in 20 years. Can you, Lee, can you, can you recommend something or like a web page or? Well, I'll just go to docker.io Docker and there's all kinds of resources out there. Oh, okay. That's where I should go. I've been uh, using Docker in action. That's a book I got from, uh, oh, who was Manning Books? Yeah, Manning Publisher. Docker in action. Let me go look at that on Amazon. Thank you. So I, I invited Robert Sitek to come here tonight, but he was very busy. He's helping a friend who has a serious medical condition. So he had to take off. But... Uh, I take uh, well the art the other doctor thing to do is uh, two years ago or whatever it was three years ago Chuck did like four sequences at uh, for the Linux group Docker 100, 101, 102, 103, or 104 or something like that and uh, they should be on the uh, on the website. Yeah, I'll, I'll scroll through the archives and take a look. Okay. And Jonathan, thank you for inviting Robert tonight. That would have been a nice addition to the meeting. Yeah, his friend uh, unfortunately has brain cancer. And so he's helping him move him into a, a medical facility, I think. Wow. That's wrong. That is wrong. I, I showed up late to the presentation. I wish I'd seen this man's, uh, uh, wish I'd seen Tyler's presentation longer, but. So did, uh, uh, did you guys hear that uh, SUSE has um, had an initial public offering of stock? Did you guys hear about that? No. Um, you know about that, Lee? I haven't seen it yet. Let me, let me, let me post it to the chat. Hold on here.
One sec, here we go. Here it is. So that there, there's a video there where they interview the woman uh, CEO. And uh, from what I've heard, guys, uh, oh, sorry, Lee, go ahead. No, I was just looking at the webpage. So what I've heard is uh, SUSE 15.3 is going to be out in uh, toward the end of June. I actually saw, I actually beat is out now. I've been using it for a couple months. Okay. On one of my laptops. Is there much change between 15.2 and 15.3, Lee? I, I don't imagine, huh? No, everything's small incremental changes. In fact, I still got a 42 something laptop I've been using because the hardware's. Uh, when I tried installing 15.1 on, I couldn't do it, so I just left it 42.3. Gotcha. You've been using SUSE longer than I have, so yeah. I've been using it for 20 years yeah. back in the uh, well before 42. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe 12 or 13, something like that. Certainly in the mid 2000s. Yeah. I got my latest version of <coughs> OpenBSD up and running. I got flamed by Theo on the list. <laughs> I asked a question and he said, don't, don't post such stupid questions here to this list. So uh, I went back and looked through the documentation and got it figured out. But he is a, a rather um, volatile guy. Oh yeah. Especially when he gets drunk. Mm. Sounds, like a, sounds like a nice guy. Let's avoid him. Well, he's... Uh, yeah, he's alienated a lot of people, but he has a great distro. I mean, the BST version. What's his name again? Theo Durant. What's his problem? Oh, he's uh, he likes to play Hitler. And if you don't, if you're not up to his standards, you make sure you know it. I'm sorry. And if you're not up to his perceived standards, he makes sure that you know it. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to just tell him to fuck off and go away. Yeah, but you don't have to if you're on a mailing list. Well, anyway, guys, I think we need to pull a plug. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting late. Have All right. Night. Great night, guys. Uh, it was a nice presentation from what I saw of it. Good night. Yeah. Good night Irene, good night. Irene, good night. <laughs> yeah, oh, something God, like that. Yeah. I thought you were leaving a while ago, Gary. <laughs> I'm like a bad pet.